Dr. Shabir, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. Pleasure to be on. Last time we looked at some of the common approaches that people take to Islam, especially the scholars, Dr. Shabir, and people who are looking to the scholars to make decisions about, you know, what's right and what's wrong. And now, Dr. Shabir, we want to look at um, contemporary scholars who have grappled with these problems themselves. So they're looking at the common approaches to Islam and saying, okay, um, you know, there are problems here and there's something that we need to solve. And they're going about trying to solve the problems um, as you are. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the point of this is to show that, you know, you're not the only one, you know, you're not from the left field, right? You're, you're part of this tradition of scholars who are looking back at the past and saying, we need to do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as we pointed out in the previous episode, there's been a long series of scholars who have always been updating and revising the opinions and verdicts of previous generations of scholars. And then eventually people thought, okay, the gates of ijtihad are closed. You cannot do any more of this ijtihad, which is that process of deriving uh, new rulings for new situations and applications for contemporary times. And we just simply follow and copy the ways of the past. But despite that, there continue to be uh, people calling for reform, such as, for example, Jamaluddin al-Afghani and uh, Muhammad Abdu and uh, the scholars of al-Azhar more generally. And uh, in our contemporary times, uh, we have seen a number of uh, scholars who boldly have been proclaiming the need for ijtihad, uh, the need for reform, and they have also been uh, chalking out some uh, of the principles uh, based on which uh, the uh, new um, applications of Islam uh, will uh, be determined for our present time. Mm -hmm. So can you give me some examples of that, Dr. Shabir? I, I know that like Khalid Abu al-Fadl comes to mind, right? In yes. the United States. Yes, Khalid Abu, uh, Abu al-Fadl is an Egyptian-born uh, scholar who uh, now teaches in the United States of America. He's trained in uh, traditional Islamic sciences. That's what they're called sciences, which means uh, the whole gamut of knowing the Quran, the life example of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and classical Islamic scholarship, jurisprudence, dealing with the Islamic law and so on. And uh, at the same time, you know, he studied in the West, so he understands uh, modern law and uh, he is teaching uh, law at, uh, at the university in California. Uh, so he's written many books, uh, including a, a book entitled The Grand Theft, in which he is talking about uh, the fact that, you know, Islam has been stolen from us. Uh, uh, we, we no longer have the, the right to interpret our religion and to understand it and apply it in a way that is uh, uh, giving rise to that beauty that we talked about previously. In fact, he himself emphasizes the uh, principle of beauty. Um, and, and there's a book that uh, he has written with uh, a title including the word beauty, like the search for beauty in mm -hmm. Islam. So he, he, is, he wants to obviously reclaim that uh, right to um, apply Islam in a way that will bring out that beauty. He is looking for original and founding, uh, grounding principles uh, on, on which Islamic law is based. Often people forget the principles uh, and they just think about the law. But the, the, uh, the law is based on certain principles. And if you apply the, the law in a stratified way, uh, then you may uh, forget the principles, and, and, and that would be horrible because it would mean that you're mechanically applying a law, uh, that, uh, and the way in which you apply it may uh, misrepresent uh, what, what Islam is about. So if, if there's a good principle that gives rise to the law, and you practice the law in a different context that doesn't uh, exhibit that good principle anymore, but in fact might be a reflection of something bad, um, not intending it so, but, but that's how it will be perceived not nonetheless, then you are misrepresenting the faith in that way. So he has written many books. Uh, one of his uh, books that I've been uh, thoroughly uh, impressed with is this book entitled Speaking in God's Name, mm -hmm. um, which uh, looks at the way in which uh, scholars uh, recently have been giving uh, verdicts, uh, saying this is the Islamic verdict, uh, they are actually speaking for God because when when the average Muslim asks, uh, "What can I, you know, what should I do here?" Really, the average Muslim did not put it in those terms. But the Muslim is asking, "What does God want from me at this moment?" So when the Muslim scholar says, "This is the verdict," that the 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 question in the mind of the questioner and and the this answer that is visible from the scholars 
uh, now put together means that this is what God wants from you. Mm -hmm. So in other words, a scholar is speaking in God's name. Mm -hmm. Scholar is saying this is what God wants, as if the scholar knows the mind of God. Um, so we have to be very careful when we are giving such verdicts because uh, often we don't know the mind of God. In fact, we can never know fully the mind of God. But mm -hmm. uh, We're just guessing at it, getting, getting as close as possible as we think we could get. Yes. And of course, there's a difference between an educated guest and, and you know, the, just the, uh, uh, the wishful thinking of any average person who doesn't really um, have a grounding in, in the sciences. Mm -hmm. So anybody can say, you have a pain in your stomach and this is the reason for the pain. But a doctor will, will give an educated uh, guess at, at what the, 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 the causes are. And, and you go to a different doctor, you may get a different guess. <laughs> uh, and that's why we seek the different opinions. Uh, but the, the opinion of a doc doctor is, is of a higher level than, than the opinion of the average person. And, and it's based on some principles, some, based on what they have studied, but they're dealing with something that's slightly vague, and so they have two different opinions. That's understandable. So Muslim scholars uh, giving verdicts on behalf of God should be careful uh, to say that, uh, you know, we, we don't really know the mind of God. Uh, we're going by some indications. There is a verse in the Quran, for example, that seems to speak to this subject. And people should be aware of their, uh, their, their interpretive um, attempts here because uh, here, here we have a show called Let the Quran Speak, but, but the Quran is not sitting in a chair and talking. Uh, we are, we're talking. We're, we're, we're saying, okay, that verse of the Quran applies to this thing. Mm -hmm. So when we say that, we're, we're interpreting. We're, you know, we're saying that's the verse that deals with this. Somebody else may say there's another verse or a set of verses that mm -hmm. deal with this or, or something like that. So mm -hmm. it's, it's an interpretive act. Mm -hmm. So when the Muslim scholar says, that's the verse of the Quran that speaks to your issue, that's an interpretive act. And we should be honest about that. We're interpreting as we go. And uh, when we come to giving a verdict based on hadith, uh, um, Khalid Abu al-Fadl points out that, uh, you know, the hadiths have been um, related by a word of mouth uh, for generations and put into writing eventually, they have to be scrutinized uh, because uh, they may not be from the Prophet at all and uh, they could have been made up later. So when a hadith has uh, a great social impact, especially when dealing with uh, women's issues, which was a, a big uh, um, uh, point within his larger book, then we, we have to see, like, what is the social impact of these hadiths before we give them a great deal of credence and make life difficult for a large number of people. Mm -hmm. So with, uh, he, he then drew up some principles of hadith. How do we regard hadith? How do we uh, evaluate them? So uh, traditionally, what uh, Muslim scholars have done is that they shied away from reason. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there, there, have, there have been schools of, uh, with reasonable approaches, but they came to be sidelined over time. And a traditional approach came to dominate. So a traditional approach basically says, uh, we're not going to use human reason here. We're just going to go by the revelation from God. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Well, God didn't say everything because we have a Quran which is uh, of 6,236 verses. Of those, uh, according to uh, a, a number put out by Tariq Ramadan, who is another uh, one calling for reform, uh, only uh, some 236 verses or so, 228, 228 verses or so, um, uh, deal with legal issues. Hmm. And, and these legal issues span a wide spectrum, dealing with personal issues, family life, uh, social issues, political issues, and so on and criminal uh, law, uh, all of, and, and uh, rituals. So when we think about, uh, uh, you know, the few, few verses, a couple of hundred, dealing with all of these issues, you can see that only a few verses are going to deal with each one of these broad uh, subheading, mm -hmm. broad, broad headings. And that means we're not getting a lot of detailed law in the Quran. Uh, so uh, Muslim scholars have had to be inventive here. They wanted a text to speak to every uh, circumstance. So what they did was that they prided themselves in, in deriving more and more rulings from the texts. Mm. Uh, so one by might, analogy? Well, sometimes by far-fetched reasoning. Okay. And they may say that this implies that, and you can see that the connection between the this and the that is so very thin uh, 
uh, that, that it's hard to really give credence to that. Nonetheless, Khaled um, Abul Fadl is saying, okay, let's look at all of these uh, issues. So where is the verdict? Where is the verdict really coming from before you say that God is saying this? Uh, there have been other reformers as well. I mentioned Tarek Ramadan. He wrote a book called uh, Radical Reform. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, it's a hefty volume and uh, it's largely theoretical. He is basically just at least trying to uh, convince his readers that uh, radical reform is necessary without getting too much into the details of what that would all uh, entail. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what about Javed Ghamidi? Uh, Javed Ghamidi, uh, Ghamidi, and uh, he's, he's a great scholar uh, representing Al Maurud Institute in Pakistan, and he has many students, including uh, Moiz Amjad from whose uh, fatwas or verdicts I've uh, learned quite a bit, um, and uh, also uh, Shahzad Salim, um, uh, who is now writing um, a lot on behalf of the uh, Al Maurud Institute. Uh, so. They, these uh, are, th this is another area uh, or, or another direction from which we see uh, the reformist ideas coming. Sticking with the Indo-Pak subcontinent, uh, for a moment, we also have uh, the scholar who recently passed away, may God have mercy on him, Malana Wahiduddin Khan, who produced an English translation of the Quran, uh, but his reform ideas are more so in his other writings, for example, in his book, uh, Islam Rediscovered, mm -hmm. in which he talks about some of the principles uh, that will give rise to a peaceful interpretation, or rather a, an interpretation of Islam as a religion of peace, one that is in harmony with science and, and, and development and, and with democracy. Uh, he puts forward the idea, for example, that uh, you know, there, there was a past age that was the age of monarchy, that's when, you know, the king was right and the king ruled and the king was, you know, the best person and uh, knew everything and people just simply followed and obeyed the king. Uh, but now we are in, a, in an age of democracy. So to try to impose the traditional way of, of dealing with uh, polity is not really going to work in modern times because it's just it's a different era. Mm -hmm. uh, so nothing wrong with what Islam was, but it doesn't have to be like that in our present time. So very interesting thinking from his part. Mm -hmm. So we mentioned some reformers, Dr. Shabiro. Why do you think there's a need for your approach then, given that all of these individuals are grappling with the tradition and coming up with their own paths? Well, um, naturally, there is a need for a unification, and a reform cannot be done by one person nowadays. There is a hadith that says um, in, in, in the Arabic, And I'm not even sure if reform is the right word, right? Uh, yes, yes, yes. So there's a hadith that says, Inna Allah yabhathu lihadi al-ummah ala ra'si kulli sana man yujadidu laha dinaha. Uh, Allah will raise at the head of every uh, century for this nation, his followers, someone who will uh, reform uh, or, or renew, renew its religion for, for it, for, for, the, for the Ummah, will renew the Ummah's religion. Uh, so renewal is probably a better word. And um, uh, what all of these scholars are trying to do, whether they call it renewal or reform, uh, they're, they're trying to look at the basic principles of the religion. They're trying to look at what is essential. And uh, they're, they're thinking about principles before law. Hmm. And they're thinking like, for example, at maqasid, uh, the, which is uh, a word in Arabic meaning objectives. Mm -hmm. so, so there is an objective and then there is a law. So mm -hmm. for example, it is prohibited to drink alcohol. So what's the reasoning behind that? What, is it that God doesn't want people to be, drink and be happy? Uh, well, the, the, the objective here is that God wants to protect us uh, from the evils of alcohol. And, and we know many evils that arise from drinking alcohol. Uh, so so th that's the objective. God wants to protect us and to help us. So he makes this prohibited so that people wouldn't even, it would be a no-brainer, you just don't go there. Rather than trying to reason, maybe I have some, then you don't know where to stop and so on, people end up having problems. So it's for our protection. So uh, that's, that's only one objective, but more broadly, the scholars say that the objectives of Islamic law are the protection of life, uh, property, uh, religion, um, and, and so on. So there are, these are broader objectives, and then you have the law flowing out of that. 
So many scholars, for example, Jasser Auda has been written, write, writing a lot about this in book after book, uh, emphasizing the uh, objectives of, uh, of the Islamic law. So in, in this way, then, we're trying to recapture what is the spirit, what is the, uh, the, the, at the basis of Islam, and, and we're trying to see how would that apply in our present time. So why, why, why the need for my particular approach? Well, uh, the scholars looking at that hadith, which says that there will be someone who will renew uh, the religion at the head of every century, are thinking now that it won't be one individual. Hmm. One individual will not have the knowledge and the ability to like carry the whole burden. But uh, uh, what would be needed is uh, um, a group of scholars, not necessarily one group of scholars, but groups of scholars. And it's not only scholars who are trained in the Islamic sciences, the traditional Islamic learning, like learning about Quran, Hadith, Islamic law, and, and benefiting from the whole um, uh, tradition of Muslim scholarship throughout the ages. But also, we have to integrate our thinking with uh, the thinking of scientists. So they have to be Muslim scientists, and not necessarily Muslim scientists. We could be consulting with uh, scientists across the board, and not only scientists in, if we're thinking about the physical sciences like uh, you know, physics, chemistry, and, and biology, uh, but we should be integrating with uh, experts in all fields of human endeavor. So if we're talking about human anthropology, we're talking about geography, we're talking about uh, as sociology, uh, all of the various fields, psychology and all of them, have to be integrated in our thinking. And so we're not, uh, we're not gonna get one person who's an expert in all of these fields, but we're going to have teams of people consulting with each other so that eventually when we say that Islam uh, says this for our present time, uh, it, it, that, that verdict is coming from an informed base. Uh, that does not in exclude any legitimate uh, search for knowledge. Wow, lots to think mm -hmm. about, Dr. Yes. Greer. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Support us today and help us share the message of Islam with people across the globe. Thank you, and may God bless you and your loved ones with the very best always. <laughs>